Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Well, we are uh, delighted to have guest speaker Jacob Cross here with us this morning. He's been speaking at a conference here in Abbotsford, and uh, we're glad he's able to come and share with us here this morning. And so, without uh, further ado, Jacob Cross, come on up. All you. Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Do I have a good signal? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with prayerful, thankful hearts as always, thanking you for your grace and for your wonderful salvation that you've given to us in the name of the Lord Jesus. We ask now, Lord God, that you'd open our eyes to your word. We ask that you'd pour your spirit upon us, Lord God, and that the things we ponder would not simply increase our knowledge with any aim of increasing our knowledge, but increasing our knowledge to make us more conform to the image and likeness of your Son, serving him and helping others in his name, the name in which we pray, Jesus. Amen. Before we turn to the Old Testament, turn with me, please, first of all, to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1. Verse 9, God who has saved us and called us with the holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. When the scriptures say Christ Jesus, it's him in heaven. When it says Jesus Christ, it's him on earth. Now notice there's a distinction in God's economy between our salvation and our calling. Our salvation and our calling are two related but very different things. Our calling is also from eternity. Not only were we saved to go to heaven, but we were saved to do something in this life and this world that will determine the magnitude of our reward in heaven and of our status in the millennial reign of Jesus. We have a purpose from God for all eternity, to fulfill in this world. Before we were born, before we were born again, before the universe as we know it existed, the Lord had something for you and for me to do. It's quite a thing. From all eternity, he had something for you, for me, to do. And we're told in Matthew 25 and elsewhere that we will give account one day whether or not we did these things. We're not talking about our salvation, but we are talking about our reward. Many people will do things, they think they're serving the Lord, but they're not ordained of God. They have good ideas, but not God ideas, and their works will be burned up. They will have failed to do the things that God purposed for them for all eternity. How does God get us to do those things he's ordained for us to do? Every believer who is serious about achieving the purposes of God for which they were born and born again, will go through a certain pattern. We see this pattern exhibited various places in Scripture, but nowhere perhaps more emphatically than in the experiences of Queen Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah. The Feast of Esther we call Purim. It's Jewish Halloween. My children are born in Galilee, and fortunately we didn't have to deal with Halloween. Jewish children get dressed up like the characters of the book of Esther at the Feast of Purim, the 14th of the Hebrew month, Adar. 
and they read the Haggadah, they read the scroll of Esther, uh, the Megillah, the scroll of Esther. And because it says Haman's name will be blotted out, the children have noisemakers and rattles. And every time it says Haman, they boo and hiss and make noise with the rattles. And then they put on a play in Hebrew so their parents can see how much Hebrew they learned in Hebrew school, Saturday school. And, you know, a little girl will be Queen Esther and things like this and they'll get some ogre from the congregation, some old guy to be, to be Haman and things like this. It's called the Portim Spear. And you give the children pastry called Oznaim Heman in Hebrew or Chomentash in Yiddish, Heman's ears. That's Jewish Halloween. It's uh, quite a thing for children. But the rabbis tell us that Queen Esther, because she had no per se father or mother, she's the only female type or shadow of the Messiah in the Old Testament. Many Old Testament figures prefigure Jesus in some way. Every Hebrew prophet and every patriarch is a type of Christ in some way, essentially. The judges of Israel were types of Christ. But Esther is the only recognized female one. She brought deliverance to her people through personal risk and sacrifice. Queen Esther. As prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Joel, the Babylonian Empire collapsed. The Persians came to power. And when that happened, a nasty politician who was not a Persian or a Jew came into position of prime minister under the king. His name was Haman. He was an Agagite, a descendant of Amalek, the ancient enemy of the Jews. And he had a plot to destroy the Jews. But Queen Esther became queen due to the failures of her predecessor, Queen Vashti, a beauty contest was held, and Esther becomes queen, and she's in the position she needs to be in to intervene on behalf of her people, and they get delivered on the 14th of Adar. To this day, Jewish people dance in the street celebrating Purim on the 14th of Adar. It's roughly around February, but I won't be here in February, so I'm doing it now in August. <clears throat> Too cold in Canada in February. Anyway... In Jewish culture called Yiddishkeit, there is a Haman in every generation. Like Haman was the, or Hitler was the Haman of the 1930s and 40s. The popes of the Middle Ages who hatched the Inquisitions were the Hamans of the Dark Ages. Well, the Haman of the 1990s was Saddam Hussein. It was agreed. What day in 1991 did Saddam Hussein, after shooting the Scud missiles at Tel Aviv and Haifa, surrenders to the Americans and British. He surrendered on the 14th of Purim. He surrendered on the Feast of Purim when people were dancing in the streets celebrating the vic same day. Now, many things like that happen. However, let no one tell you that contemporary events in the Middle East don't fulfill biblical prophecy. They do. One of the strengths of Calvary Chapels as a movement has been that Chuck Smith has always emphasized that. He's always recognized that. Many churches have not. Calvary's have because of the influences of Chuck. But such it is. The Feast of Esther, let's begin at the beginning. Turn with me, please, to the book of Esther. We have two Esthers. We have the book of Esther in Scripture, and we have a non-canonical historical book of Esther in the Apocrypha, giving us further historical background. But let's look. To make a longer story shorter, for the sake of brevity, Queen Vashti dishonors her husband. You have this typology where the king goes for another woman, okay? Much the same as Jesus went to the Gentile church. The king held out his scepter. Nobody comes before the king unless they were drawn. Nobody comes unless you have to be drawn. Okay. There's much typology. If you were to read the Septuagint version of Esther in the Greek Old Testament instead of the Hebrew, you see the celestial imagery of Revelation chapter 1 draws strongly on Esther chapter 1. We've got the seven eunuchs, seven angels, it's all the sevens. The imagery of heaven draws on the imagery of the celestial court in ancient Persia. From a literary perspective, it's a very interesting book. 
Nonetheless, let's read chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she'd done and what had been decreed against her. She was out. Then the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to Susa, the capital, to the harem into the custody of Haggai. Haggai has the name of festal, or holiday, it means feast. The king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given to them. Then the young lady who pleases the king, let her be queen in place of Ashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the capital, whose name was Mordechai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives, who had been exiled with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled circa 585 B.C. By this time, the Babylonians fell, and the Persians came to power, as Daniel and Isaiah predicted. And he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther. Esther comes from Ashtaroth, it's a pagan name. Her Jewish name was Hadassah, which is a kind of a myrtle plant. Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face, and when her father and her mother died, Mordechai took her as his own daughter. So it came about, when the command and decree of the king were heard, and many young ladies were gathered to Susa, the capital, into the custody of Hagi, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Hagi, who was in charge of the women. Now the young lady pleased him and found favor with him. So he quickly provided her with cosmetics and food and gave her seven choice maids from the king's palace and transferred her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordechai had instructed her that she should not make them known. And every day Mordechai walked back and forth in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. And when the turn of each young lady came to go to the king, Ahasuerush, after the end of her twelve months under the regulations for women, pay attention, for the days of their beautification were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with spices, and the cosmetics for women. The young lady would go into the king in this way. Anything she desired was given to her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning return to the second harem, to the custody of Shaaskaz, the other name of Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Avihail, the uncle of Mordechai, who had taken her as his daughter, came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Hagi, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus to his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, and the king loved Esther more than all the women. She found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head, and she became queen instead of Vashti. Now we understand certain things. This nasty man in chapter 3, Haman, verse 1, was promoted by King Ahasuerus. And he's the one who was the Jew hater, determined to destroy the Jews. Let's begin by understanding the nature of anti-Semitism of Jew hatred. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will bruise him in the heel, he will bruise you in the head. Because the Messiah and salvation would come to Israel, Satan had to destroy the woman had to destroy Israel. We can think of persecution of the true church and anti-Semitism as a coin. You take the coin, and on the coin we have heads and tails. 
We can distinguish between heads and tails, but we cannot separate them. Satan wants to destroy two kinds of people. He wants to destroy Israel and the Jews, and he wants to destroy born-again believers. The same as the first coming of Christ depended on God's prophetic plan for Israel, the return of Christ depends on God's prophetic plan for Israel just as much as it depends on the church. So let's go look at it. Let's look at the first century. Who did the Roman Empire, pagan Rome, persecute the most? Jews, born-again Christians. In the Inquisitions, who did the Roman Catholic Church persecute the most? Jews, born-again Christians. Before the Iron Curtain came down, who did the communists persecute the most? Jews, born-again Christians. Who does Islam hate the most? Jews and Christians, especially born-again Christians. It was way back to Genesis. Predates even the New Testament. Haman, Amalek, and Pharaoh. Wipe them out to prevent the Messiah from coming. Stop salvation. Didn't work, but he's always tried, and he's still trying to wipe out the Jews and to wipe out the true church, and he will keep trying until Jesus comes back and destroys him. Well, let's understand this further. Esther and Mordechai were from the tribe of Benjamin. Haman was an Amalekite, or an Agagite. He was a descendant of Agag. Agog were the ancient enemies of the Jews, Amalek. Moses was told, get rid of these guys. If you don't get rid of them, they'll get rid of you. King Saul was removed from power because he refused to get rid of the Amalekites, remember? He looked for some good in them. And Samuel said, what is this breeding of the sheep I hear? Well, there's some good things about it. You know. He was a Benjamite. He didn't get rid of Agog. So Agog comes back to get them. Let's understand why Esther and Mordecai had to be from the same tribe as King Saul. Look at Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49, verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, but in the evening he divides the spoil. Jacob's prophecy to these tribes are played out biblically and historically. What he prophesies about them is what happens. Benjamin is the one who always begins bad, but ends good. Benjamin begins bad and ends good. How did the early Christians understand this prophecy? Of what tribe was Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle? They always begin bad and end good. They begin as ravenous wolves, devourers. But then they divide the booty. Because it was a Benjamite king, Saul, who failed to get rid of Amalek, who failed to get rid of Agak. It had to be a Benjamite who did, you understand? It had to be somebody from the same tribe. Benjamin always begins bad, but ends good. So here we have Esther and her uncle, whom stepfather Mordechai. King Saul didn't get rid of Agak. And he comes back to get you. Pay attention. The enemies of God's people, no matter how ancient, will always be our enemies. They may change strategies, but they will always be our enemies. My wife and children are Israeli Jews. Talmudic Judaism, the false Judaism of the rabbis, will always hate and persecute Messianic Judaism. The Orthodox Jews who reject their Messiah will always hate and persecute the Jews who believe in Jesus as the Messiah. It's not going to change. It's not going to change. Islam will always be the enemy of Christianity. Look what they're doing in Egypt and Syria right now. Forget about Islam and it being a religion of peace and tolerance. That's lying politicians with an agenda. Of the 57 Muslim countries in the world, they cannot show you one Muslim country where Christians or Jews will get the same rights that Muslims get in Canada or any other Western country, including Israel. 
It's a lie. The politicians know they're lying, but of course, that's what they get paid for. As we unfortunately know, if politicians couldn't lie, they wouldn't have anything to say. Ancient enemies will always be our enemies. I was coming over this morning, and we just happened to come by a Roman Catholic radio station. They were defending the term Mary, Mother of God, theatikos, a term not found in Scripture. And they said, we're not saying, well, the Catholic Church does not teach that she's actually God's mother, pre-existing God. This came about at the Council of Ephesus, which it did, and which I knew in the 5th century, which I knew because of Nestorius, who denied the deity of Christ. And so, to affirm the deity of Christ, we said that Mary was the Articles, the bearer of God. It was simply a way to affirm the deity of Christ. It sounds plausible. Of course, what he didn't tell you was, in Roman Catholic theological literature, they do not translate the Articles as bearer of God, but they translate it Mater Dei, Mother of God, a pagan title that goes back to Tammuz and his mother in ancient Babylon, that goes back to Semiramis. He didn't tell people the truth. Maybe he didn't know the truth himself. He didn't tell you that. Our faith is apostolic, not patristic. The apostles got their doctrine directly from Jesus. The church fathers came later and rewrote Christianity as a Hellenistic religion. They didn't tell you that Ephesus was the center of Diana worship in the book of Acts and afterwards. And they began to attribute the attributes of Diana of Ephesus to Mary. And he certainly didn't tell them that we don't really translate it as bearer of God. We translate it as Mother Dei, Mother of God. Well, if Mary is God's mother, I'd like to see God's father. <clears throat> Calvary chapels are loaded with ex-Catholics. How many people here are ex-Catholics? In the States, you'd find predominantly, most Calvaries have 70% ex-Catholics in the United States. 7 out of 10. If you want to know what Roman Catholicism is, ask somebody saved out of it. <laughs> They'll tell you. This has always been antithetical to our beliefs. There is no way Roman Catholicism can ever be compatible with biblical Christianity. No way. For all of their faults and mistakes, the Protestant reformers were from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic priesthood. Every one of them was a Roman Catholic priest who was a scholar. Every one of them. Every single one of them. Luther learned that the word, for all of his later faults, he learned that the word metanoia from left of your meant not the sacrament of penance going to confession, but it meant to repent. It means salvation comes by repenting and believing instead of by a the ritual of going to confession, yes, blew his mind. That changes everything. No, Talmudic Judaism will never be compatible with Messianic Judaism. Roman Catholicism, among other corruptions of Christianity, will never be compatible with the true gospel. Islam will never be compatible with belief in Jesus. Ancient enemies remain ancient enemies. They may change their strategy, but they're going to remain your enemy. You can just read Roman Catholic apologists, and you'll see what they say. You can read what the Mormons really say about born-again Christians. You can read farms and the, Roman, and the Mormon publications, what they really think of us. What they say to us and what they say about us are two different things. Agog is Agog. He's not going to change. Might change his name to Haman, but he's still Amalek. And so Esther finds herself in this position. Somebody is hatching a plot to destroy her people. And there she is with her stepfather, her uncle Mordechai. God gets her in the position that she needs to be in to bring deliverance to her people. And then Mordechai tells her as much. Once she becomes queen, he tells her in chapter 4, Verses 13 and 14, Mordechai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you can in the king's palace escape any more than all the Jews. 
If you remain silent at this time, deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. Who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. The position she got into and all it took to get there is somewhere that God put her to fulfill her calling. And Mordecai rightly tells her, if you don't fulfill this calling, don't think you can save your own neck either. Deliverance will arise from somewhere else. The Lord loved Israel. The Lord chose Israel. But the Lord did not need Israel. The Lord, for some reason, loved me. The Lord, for some reason, chose me. But the Lord sure does not need me. The Lord chose you because he loves you. Yes, he desires to use you. But he doesn't need you either. If God needed anybody, he wouldn't be God. But he is God. You have a calling. There is something he wants you to do. Something you were born to do. Something you were born again to do. Something that God concocted before existence existed. From all eternity, says Paul. Will you do it? There was a beauty contest. Of all things, she had to win a beauty contest. Now understand there is much literary symbolism and typology in this. The church is adorned for her husband, etc. There is a whole symbolic level of meaning, metaphorically, in this typology. She had to win a beauty contest to be where she needed to be in order to do what God ordained for her to do from all eternity. She had to win the beauty contest, not first runner-up. Now, a beauty contest is a curious thing. You can be the prettiest girl in the street where you live. You can be the prettiest girl in your class in school. You can be the prettiest girl in the church you attend. But in a beauty contest, all the girls are pretty. Now you've got serious competition, toots. You've got to have something better than a mother pretty face and a cute figure. You've really got to deliver the goods. There's got to be something that makes you stand out above and beyond the other pretty girls. There's only one winner. Only one. You have to win. If you don't win, you're out of the contest. How did God make her a winner? Same way he makes us winners. It was a process of beautification. Six months and six months. There was the season of myrrh, then the season of spice. Let's begin with the myrrh. The Magi bought the myrrh when Jesus was born. They bought the gold because he'd be king. They bought the incense because he'd be high priest. But they bought the myrrh because he would die. John chapter 19, verse 39. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, they bring a mixture of aloes and myrrh. Anointed for burial. The first thing God does to make us a winner is make us a loser. He anoints us for burial. He kills our old nature. Not just the obviously sinful old nature. I was a cocaine addict when I was in university. When I got saved, I was strung out on coke. Of course he delivered me from that, but that's not what the season of myrrh is. He doesn't just get rid of our bad points. He gets rid of our good points. If somebody has polio and they die, they don't have polio anymore. (laughs) 
Our good points, our human abilities, sanctified to God's service, that's good. Praise God for new motives. But it's never good enough. Those natural abilities, even consecrated to God's service, will always be natural grounds for pride and self-sufficiency. Somebody can be a very talented musician. Maybe they went to a conservatory and they're educated in harmonic theory and can play several instruments extremely well. That does not make somebody a worship leader. To lead worship under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is something different. It might make them an entertainer, but it will not make them a worship leader. Somebody can be a very good physician or surgeon or dentist, very good, professionally highly qualified. That doesn't make them a medical missionary. Somebody can be an orator, a stage actor, a barrister, a very animated public speaker or lawyer. They have what Irish people call the blondie, the gift of the gab, they know how to throw it. Yes. Can God use that? Absolutely. But not until he crucifies it. Just like the little boy who brought his lunch to Jesus. First Jesus blessed it. Then Jesus broke it. Then he used it to feed others. He can't use what he doesn't break. And what he breaks is us. In other words, in God's economy, there's the season of myrrh. We cannot know success until we know failure. We cannot know victory until we know disappointment. We cannot prevail in his strength until we recognize our own weakness. Yeah, Paul had the intellect, he had the Roman citizenship, he had the theological education. But look what happened to him before God used him. He disappeared into Arabia for about eight years. You want God to bless you and use you? Are you really serious? The first thing that will happen is a season of murder. You will go through a dark night of the soul. Everything in your life will go wrong. God, why are you doing this to me? Sometimes it will be academic failure. Sometimes it will be financial setback. Sometimes it'll be relationships that disappoint. But if you really want to serve God, it'll usually be all of the above plus more. <laughs> Forget about Murphy's proverbial law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. In the season of mirth, things that can't possibly go wrong go wrong. <laughs> and there's this sense of abandonment. It's like God has put his hand against us. Lord, why are you doing this to me? I wanted to serve you. I became a Christian. I gave up everything to be a believer. And I would have said, nothing's working, nothing. And it goes on day to day. Week to week. That's the season of murder. You see, a preacher can tell you this. I can tell you this. But only the Holy Spirit can teach you this. I can only tell you. I can't teach you. This is something you have to learn from God himself. Don't be a Mordecai. If you have unsaved parents, you need to find a Mordecai. If you come from a Christian family and one or both of your parents are committed Christians, you don't know how blessed and how fortunate you are. You take it for granted. might be a pastor, pastor's wife, an older brother or sister in the Lord, there will be a Mordecai. Somebody who's been there, done that, and got the t-shirt. Somebody who's been around the block a few times and knows how the game is played. Find your Mordecai. You've been saved 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Mordecai, find your Esther. That's your ministry. Investing in the next generation. There will be a season of murder before he blesses you. You break us before he gives us victory. 
He causes us to be disappointed. He, or he gives us success. He gives us failure. The fact is, because of the world and because of the old nature, we can't handle success. Power, privilege, wealth, we will mishandle those things the same as the world does. We would mishandle wealth and power and privilege. We would mishandle those things the same as the world does if we tried to handle them in our own strength with our own wisdom. We can't handle that blessing. We can't handle that power until we've been anointed for burial. Six months! Some people, it might be six years. That's relative to the individual. But I'll tell you this. The more you have going for you humanly, the more difficult the breaking. The more clever you are, the more educated you are, the more fit you are, the more privileged you are socially. Oh, God can use those things. But they're always natural grounds for self-sufficiency, trying to serve God in our own strength with our own wisdom, and we will lose every time. He doesn't want us to lose. He wants us to win. Then, he can use that stuff. After the season of myrrh, comes the season of spice. Esther put up with the season of myrrh. She listened to Mordecai. She persevered. During the season of myrrh, she slept on a straw mat on the floor. No gourmet food, no spicy food, no nothing like that. Very strict conditions that served no purpose other than to make life rather bland. And no way out except to quit and give up the game. She went through it. Then, however, comes the season of spice. And things get good. Things go from bad to good. And maybe eventually they go from good to unbelievably good. Praise God. Yeah, praise God, but look out. The way we handle blessing can be a bigger pest than the way we handle disappointment. The way we handle success can be a bigger test of our faith and our faithfulness than the way we handle failure. When you're flat broke and you have to trust God for everything, all you can do is trust the Lord Jesus, get me out of this. Got a platinum credit card or two? Life is smooth. Eh, no problem. That was my problem. When the Lord called me to the mission field, I was, in the Middle East, I was well on my way to being a, not the post, but I was well on my way to being a self-made millionaire in my 20s. And boy, can I put my case forth. You want me to go to Israel? Look, look, there's more Jews in Queens than there is in Tel Aviv. Why do I have to? They want me to evangelize through it. Hey, look. Look at these donations I'm making. You see that it missions into evangelism into the persecuted church. Like, now look, you know, you know, philanthropy. Somebody's got to write these checks, right? <laughs> of course, my vacations in Switzerland and gourmet dinners at the 21 Club in Manhattan, they, they factored into the equation, but I didn't mention that in my prayers. <laughs> I would have been better off if I had always been broke. If I had never had had money, I would have been better off than to have been loaded, at least what most people would call, after one, and have to trust God for everything. With a young family, I'd been to university, but now I had to go to seminary. Go to England, London, an expensive city with a family. How am I going to do this? I trust God for everything. Seasons of myrrh. But then comes the season of spice. 
When things get good, be careful. When things got good for Queen Esther, she asked Mordecai, what should I do? When she went to the king, she could have anything she wanted. What's it going to be, dearie, Max Factor or Helena Rubinstein? You want the blue dress or the green one? Versace? Gucci and Gucci? It's your call, kid. Fabergé? Mother of Pearl. What do you want? She could have had anything she wanted. But hey, guy knew how to please the king. <laughs> The Spirit searches the depths of God. It's not, what do I want to do with this privilege, this power, this money? It's, well, why did you give it to me? That's the question. What has undermined the church in the Western world, Laodicea, is not poverty, it's been affluence. Not the affluence itself, but the mishandling of it. Money's not the problem. We're the problem. Power's not the problem. We're the problem. It's like any sex is not the problem. We're the problem. We're the problem. How you handle the season of spice. You want to go to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, or Princeton? Maybe MIT. Lord, where do you want me to go? Do you want to marry Dorothy or Beatrice? Do you want to marry Philip or Derek? <laughs> Lord, who do you want me to marry to serve you? Oh, you're going into the ministry. You want to evangelize the Eskimos or preach to the pygmies? Lord, where do you want me to go? You want me to be a missionary or a pastor? When things are good, we have to trust the Lord just as solidly and desperately as we do when things are tough. When things are tough, we don't have much choice. But when things are good, we can make our own choices. That's where we can blow it very easily. She makes the right choices! If you're newly saved, if you've only been saved a few months or a year, or maybe two years, something like that, you haven't been to your season of myrrh yet. But if you really want to serve Jesus, don't worry, it's coming, I guarantee it. You'll get there. Nobody gets left out. At least nobody who's serious about their faith. You'll get there. Maybe you're an Esther, or maybe you're a Mordecai. If you're an Esther, find Mordecai. If you're a Mordecai, find Esther. Make her a queen. Then again, maybe you're in that season of no. Everything has gone wrong. Everything you've tried. Finance, career, relationships, ministry, everything has gone wrong! Good, you're right on target. <laughs> or maybe you're in the season of spice. It's about time I got a break. <laughs> I've had it rough for years. Yeah, welcome to the club. <laughs> I could tell you some stories all day if you want. It's just the way it is. Whether you're an Esther or a Mordecai, whether you are in the season of myrrh or the season of spice, if you really want to do the things that the Lord has saved you to do from all eternity, this is what's going to happen to you. No exceptions. No. Don't blow it!
invest your talents wisely. Matthew 25. Mordechai told her, If you remain silent at this time, deliverance will arise from another place. He wants to use you to do it. He even wants to use me. Of all people. He wants to use you. But if you don't do it, he'll get somebody else. There'll always be a David standing on back of a Saul. There'll always be another Benjamite like Mordecai to succeed where Saul failed. Don't blow it. You got one shot. Season of America. Season of spice. Some people here today are in a season of mud. Some today are in a season of spice. Some of you are Esthers. Some of you are Mordecai's. One thing is for sure. It's only winners who count. There's no place for losers. It's true for me. It's true for you. Understand this. No matter which season you are in, God is out to make you a winner. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. In this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church. Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.